Welcome to the fifth part of the series, where I will be discussing wavelength stabilization of laser diodes and why it is important for this project. To recap, the laser diode is used in the interferometer because it is low cost and very compact. However, unlike alternatives such as helium neon lasers, laser diodes do not inherently produce light with a stable wavelength. This presents a challenge since in an interferometer, the wavelength acts as the ruler used to measure distances and a ruler, no matter how finely marked, is useless if its length keeps changing unpredictably. To solve this problem, the design uses both sides of a glass plate as a dual beam splitter, effectively creating two interferometers simultaneously. In the stabilization arm, the light travels a fixed distance before being measured by a detector. The resulting interference signal makes it possible to detect any changes in the laser's wavelength. A microcontroller then changes the drive current and temperature to compensate for any wavelength drift of the laser diode. Before we dive into how this is achieved, it is important to first discuss mode hops. Mode hops are a common issue with laser diodes and present a significant challenge for achieving accurate measurements. To understand this phenomenon, it is helpful to recall how the resonator inside a laser functions. In a laser diode, it consists of two planar mirrors between which light bounces back and forth as shown in this simulation. Looking at the electric field on the left, it becomes apparent that standing waves emerge in a fixed pattern. However, this only occurs for very specific wavelengths that are supported by the resonator. If the wavelength is even slightly off a resonant frequency, no stable pattern forms and the light intensity doesn't accumulate. In a simplified model of the resonator, the electric field can be represented as a sinusoidal curve. The electric field is constrained to zero amplitude at the mirror surfaces. This reveals that only waves with an integer number of full cycles can exist between the two mirrors. Such a stable wave pattern is called a resonator mode, and a mode hop happens if the laser jumps from one such pattern to another. The wavelength difference between two neighboring modes is called the free spectral range, or FSR for short. Here, the resonator amplification is plotted over a range of wavelengths. The sharp peaks indicate that only specific wavelengths resonate effectively within the laser cavity. The distance between two adjacent peaks corresponds to the free spectral range. In a typical laser, a gain medium is placed inside the resonator. It absorbs external energy and amplifies the light passing through it, without changing its phase or frequency. As a result, more and more energy accumulates in the mode that is already resonating within the laser. It is important to note the gain medium is most effective around a specific central frequency, with its amplification decreasing on either side of the spectrum. Among all the resonator-supported wavelengths, the one with the highest gain from the laser medium dominates and receives the most energy. Both the peak frequency of the gain medium and the resonator modes shift with temperature, as shown in this animation. At a certain point, two modes become equally favorable, leading to mode hopping, where the laser erratically jumps from one lacing frequency to another. This continues until another stable temperature region is reached, where a single mode dominates again. Looking at the signals from the two photo detectors of the stabilization arm, while increasing the temperature shows this phenomenon very clearly. Pausing here for a moment reveals the signal jumping between two curves, which result from the different wavelengths between two neighboring modes. In the XY plot, it becomes painstakingly obvious why mode hops are a problem for the interferometer. To avoid these problems, the temperature of the laser diode is controlled by the microcontroller to bring it into a stable temperature range. To change the temperature, resistive heating was chosen over a peltier element. While it cannot actively cool the system, it is more compact, easier to drive electronically, and likely generates less waste heat near the device. In practice, a small PCB is mounted to the diode holder. Four resistors positioned near the laser diode provide the necessary heating, while numerous vias and a bit of thermal paste help transfer heat efficiently to the brass holder. A digital temperature sensor glued to the holder provides feedback to the microcontroller. Even though the sensor is not accurate enough to stabilize the wavelength, 
it allows to consistently reach an operating region free of mode hops. During the startup phase of the device, a control loop brings the temperature to the desired set point, where the laser operates in a mode hop free region. The plot on the left shows the control loop error in green and the heater output in blue. When the target temperature is reached and held for a given amount of time, the device switches to the operation state to actively stabilize the wavelength. This is achieved by slightly adjusting the laser diode current using a digital PID control loop within the microcontroller. In the plot on the left, the wavelength error is shown in green, while the integral term of the controller is shown in orange. As you can see, changing the current is both fast and precise, effectively stabilizing the wavelength. Unfortunately, the current adjustment has a limited range, so even slight changes in ambient temperature or other disturbances can quickly saturate the controller. Once this happens, wavelength errors can no longer be compensated. To prevent this issue, we use the heater in a secondary control loop to desaturate the current controller. In other words, a second controller adjusts the temperature with the goal of driving the integral term of the current controller towards zero. Here on the left, the integral term of the current controller is shown in orange. The output of the wavelength temperature controller is shown in blue. Note that the initial temperature controller used during startup is now disabled and the temperature sensor is no longer used during wavelength control. You can observe that the integral term is gradually reduced towards zero over time. With this control scheme, the temperature of the laser diode can be maintained with very high precision, and disturbances are compensated much more quickly by the current controller than would be possible with temperature control alone. To summarize, during startup, a simple temperature control loop is used to bring the laser into a suitable operating range. During operation, a two-stage controller is used. The inner loop controls the laser's drive current based on the wavelength error measured by the stabilization arm. The outer loop adjusts the temperature based on the integral term of the current controller to keep it in an optimal operating region. To conclude this video, I would like to answer a question many of you might have. How accurately can the wavelength be stabilized? The visualization shows that there is some noise present in the wavelength signal, which ultimately limits the achievable accuracy of the system. However, this noise is much smaller than initially expected when I started this project, and there is some potential to reduce it even further in the future. By analyzing the noise, we see that the wavelength can be stabilized to within plus minus two nanometers over a range of 200 millimeter. This is a huge milestone for the project. This suggests that the chosen approach is practical and that we are on the right track. To put this into perspective, if you take 13 4K monitors side by side, then scale them down to the diameter of a human hair, a nanometer is as big as a single pixel of one of the screens. 